47, 48, 49. Well, what are you doing out here? It's almost time for us to talk about new movies that no one cares about. <sighs> Sorry, John. I was just doing some uh, push-ups. Push-ups? But why? Is Elon Musk cyberbullying you on Twitter again? No, no, no. Nothing that serious. No, I decided to start bulking up a bit for my next film role. But Will, you said you'd never act in a movie again if Rami Malek actually won an Oscar for Bohemian Rhapsody. What gives? Well, John, I'll tell you what changed. I watched Nobody, a new movie. Nobody? How's that even possible for a movie? Doesn't someone need to be in it? No, no, John, you idiot. The movie is called Nobody. Well, if it's called Nobody, then who's in it? Nobody. But that doesn't make sense. Surely somebody's in the movie. Nope, just nobody. And if nobody can be in a movie like nobody, then maybe, just maybe, a nobody somebody like me can be in a movie like nobody too. Gosh, Will, my body hurts. So what's this new film role of yours? Well, it starts off with me being your average unassuming guy with a shady, mysterious past. But Will, I thought you said you'd be acting. Hush, John, I'm monologuing. Anyway, one night, something terrible happens and awakens a long, dormant part of me that I put away when I became just some regular schlub who talks about movies on the internet. Will, you're scaring me again. Good. That's the idea. Eventually, it's revealed that I'm actually a secret badass hunk who can take down, say, your average Russian mafia kingpin who happens to be in a downtown metropolitan area. But, Will, isn't it time for a movie with violence in it to have villains who represent the systemic oppressive issues that actually plague most people in this country, outside of a vague, poorly defined othering of criminal groups that have zero to no impact on the actual problems facing America? Speak for yourself. I... wait, John, did you hear that? You there, you cinemaholic swine. Will, what's going on? Who are these goons? Oh no, it looks like our negative review of Flora and Ulysses has finally reached the Kremlin. You did not understand the power and majesty of Super Squirrel. Now you pay ultimate price. Also, we are not Russian. We're from Canada. Oh? Whereabouts? Well, I grew up mostly in Toronto. In my teenage years, I spent summers in Prince Newfoundland. Oh cool, I have a cousin from Toronto. I do enjoy Degrassi. Degrassi? You despicable American trash. I'll show you. Whoa, Will, you just took down all of these guys single-handedly. How did you even do that? Well, John, I'll tell you, it's simple. I'm somebody. But I thought you were nobody. No, those guys were nobodies. I'm somebody. Okay, well, what does that make me? Annoying. Welcome once again to Cinemaholics, where we talk about the biggest and best films coming to theaters and streaming online from San Francisco. I am John Negroni, chief editor of Cinemaholics, and known to some people around the country as John Somebody. That is a reference to a movie that I don't know if anybody really remembers outside of you and me. Well, but okay. well, I think uh, you mean uh, Joe Somebody, not John Somebody. Joe Somebody. But yeah. Well, I said John. Well, my name isn't Joe. Right. Right. But the movie is called Joe Somebody. It's from 2002. And anyway, yeah. <laughs> from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There he is. He's a pop culture writer for Cinema Blend and the proud owner of a Garfield kitty cat bracelet. It's Will Ashton. Hello. You can find more episodes of Cinemaholics, including our full archive on cinemaholics.com, including written reviews and other bonus content. You can write into the show anytime by sending us an email. Our email, as always, is cinemaholicspodcast at gmail.com. There are two main ways for you to support this podcast help us keep it going you can check out our merch page on cinemaholics.com where we sell hoodies and mugs t-shirts shot glasses all cinemaholics branded so you can show your friends i listen to cinemaholics too we should be friends or you can go to our patreon or you do both go to patreon.com slash cinemaholics to find out ways that you can donate directly to our show and we appreciate all the support from all of you this week, we are going to be discussing a new movie called Nobody, which stars Bob Odenkirk. That's going to be a fun discussion. We'll also get into the new Netflix comedy Bad Trip and a prestige kind of Sundance 2020 favorite called The Courier, which I think it was originally called Iron Bark, but now it's The Courier. What are you going to do? 
Before we get all of, before we get to all of that, however, a few off topics to get to. First off, extra milestone. Julia Tatey and myself talked about the classic 1946 film, Gilda. That was a ton of fun. Love talking about that classic movie. It's a great discussion. It's already on the podcast feed, so you can check that out now. And we talked about the new Amazon Prime video show, Invincible, which is an animated comic book superhero adaptation of the comic book from 2003. This is the Robert Kirkman thing. Robert Kirkman, of course, of The Walking Dead. The first three episodes just premiered, and so I had a chance to talk about the first three episodes, basically spoiler-free and all of that, of course, with special guest Maggie Shauna Pierre. That episode is out on the feed right now as well. Well, I know you checked out the first episode of Invincible. Listeners prob- might have already caught. I did really like the show, but uh, what do you, you think of the first episode, kind of real quick? I thought it was all right. I definitely thought I picked up in the second half as opposed to the first. I know the first half of it was just laying down the characters and the stakes and all that. So, you know, I, I, I expected that to happen in a pilot, but um, it's interesting. Like I was telling you off the air, it's not really my type of thing. I didn't really grow up with the type of shows that's like semi parroting. So I don't, I, I don't think I'm the target audience for this thing, but I can definitely see the appeal from the first episode. Right on, right on. Uh, again, that is on Amazon Prime. Now, we are going to be talking about The Father soon. Uh, we might be able to talk about it in a bonus review later this week, or we might put it to next week. just depends on how our schedules align. But we will be talking about that since it did hit VOD. And uh, there's also Godzilla vs. Kong, which is going to be coming out on Wednesday. And unfortunately, we weren't able to catch any screeners of the film ahead of time. So we won't be able to talk about that movie until later as well. But rest assured, all of the, those movie reviews, they're coming. They're in the oven. They just need a little time to cook. So we'll get there. Let's start things off proper with a review of Nobody. So they took maybe 20 bucks and an old watch? Mr. Madsen. Would you even take a swing? No. Could have taken her, Dad. Heard you had some excitement last night. I wish they'd have picked my place, you know? Why didn't you take him out? I was just trying to keep the damage to a minimum. Yeah, how's that working out for you? You okay? Because you don't look okay. There's a long dormant piece of me that so very badly wants out. What are you still doing here, old man? I'm gonna mess you up. (laughs) Nobody is a new action thriller film directed by Ilya Naishuler. Uh, who I I have to admit, I I was not familiar with this guy before watching this movie. He is a Russian musician and filmmaker. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, his band is called uh, Biting Elbows, and I have heard of Biting Elbows. But uh, yeah, I do remember one other movie he's done, Hardcore Mm -hmm. Henry. Yeah, I believe- I don't know uh, if you and I ever talked about it. Yeah, that was before Cinemaholic's time. Um, I think that was like- 2016, I want to say, the year before, yeah. And I think, was that his first film? Was that his debut? I I don't remember exactly, yeah. It was his debut, but that's the thing. He's done a bunch of other stuff, like music videos, I think, and I'm not as familiar with that. Yeah, Yeah. because Harker Henry was based on like a short film or a music video, I remember that. Exactly, exactly. So we we definitely watched it, and uh, yeah, it was either 2016, it might have been 2015, one of the, it was around that time. And I, I gotta admit, I wasn't the biggest fan of Hardcore Henry. Like, I really liked the concept, but I just couldn't quite. I don't know. The movie kind of lost me a few times. I, it was a little much. I, I had like a headache after that movie, honestly. But I did enjoy watching it like on the big screen. That was a cool experience. Yeah, I mean that was an interesting one because I remember being really hyped for it, and I think. Similar to you, like I felt like in spurts, it really works. Like the adrenaline scene in that film is pretty great. Exactly. But yeah. um, I feel like because, you know, you, like I said before, it's based on a short film and you can kind of tell because like the premise doesn't really lend itself to a film format that well. It has kind of like a video game feel in that like he, he has to like beat up all these people and then he meets with this like secondary character who's like exposition, exposition and then other fight scene and stuff like that. So it was interesting in that respect. Like It did kind of feel like a first person, whatever, like fighter shooter game, whatever. But um, 
Um, I don't think it particularly lended itself well to a film format because, like you said, the bit kind of got tired after a while, even though that film was only, I think, 90 minutes as well. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I did enjoy it, though, like as an experiment of like, what if we did an entire movie that was all first person, like a video game? And it's kind of like a fisheye lens sort of thing. I feel like somebody else could come in and take that concept and do something even better. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, nobody else has really picked that idea up since then, which is kind of a shame. But regardless, uh, so nobody is his follow up. And I think it's definitely a more conventional film by comparison uh, not, not to say anything negative about it it's just definitely trying to be a lot more similar to other types of movies that you might recognize so to that point this was written by Derek Colstead who helped create the John Wick series of films now John Wick of course already is pretty derivative of a lot of action movies like Die Hard and Rambo and all of these movies and stuff about one person kind of taking on a bunch of bad guys. And nobody is kind of like that too. It does a few different things with it. It starts with Bob Odenkirk as this kind of, you know, ordinary guy. He just doesn't seem like somebody who would do anything that insane or be violent or anything like that he's kind of living a very chill unremarkable routine life this movie actually opens with a very interesting editing style where they're trying to really get across how monotonous his days are and you're kind of thinking to yourself like okay this guy is going to go on some sort of rampage because every, he's just constantly emasculated by the people in his life his wife is very distant from him she it, it seems like she just doesn't see him as somebody who has a lot of masculinity or sticks up for himself yeah his like everybody like beats up on the guy you know thinks that he's just a what's the word nobody is that how you would say it? pretty much your average uh mr incredible type who his days of glory are no longer in front of him his glory so. days yeah. Well, they don't even allude to that there might be glory days yeah. in the beginning. They just sort of say that this, he's kind of always been like this, maybe, right? But then, of course, there is an inciting incident where his house is broken into. And in order to sort of like right the wrong of what's happened, he decides he's going to maybe go and try to resolve this. And we find out pretty fast that maybe, maybe there's more to this guy than we thought. Maybe he's a little bit addicted, actually, to violence itself and he starts to relapse into violence and as this movie was going I, there were a lot of red flags i saw i, I was kind of like oh my gosh this definitely feels like a brawl cell block 99 kind of movie which is fine for sure it's like that's a good movie and everything but i was like we're, we're getting another one of these you know where this guy has to sort of go through the fight club thing and I'm like well like how's it gonna stand on its own and do its own thing and I was definitely pleasantly surprised. I didn't watch a trailer or anything, went into it totally fresh and blank. And as it went along, I was really taken with this. I, th I think that it goes into some interesting directions and the action really picks up. So I'm pretty happy with nobody I'm trying to stay pretty spoiler free on this one. But I don't know. Will, what, what did you think? I, I, don't, I have no idea what to expect from you here. Sure. Yeah, I had um, pretty high expectations for this. I did see a trailer. I saw it a few times, in fact. It's a really good trailer because it, it understands that this is a pretty simple bare bones premise and it just sells you on that hook, which is basically, like you said, like, what if Bob Odenkirk became John Wick, which uh, it doesn't really make a secret of. Like, it, it's pretty open about how it's fairly derivative of that film, which is something I kind of admire. And sometimes I feel like it pushes it, it, it holds it back because. Pardon me, when I saw people were like, oh, this is Bob Odenkirk's John Wick, I was just like, yeah, you know, people say that a lot about a lot of things now, because John Wick is like the most popular action film, basically. But when I was watching the film, I was like, oh, this really is Bob Odenkirk's John Wick. Like, I mean, they, you know, they kind of mad lib some of the plot details, but by and large, the structure of the film is pretty similar. And uh, not to say that that holds it back or anything, like I said, just it took me aback a little bit. But I will say, I mean, I do really appreciate. Not only that the film is pretty self-aware about itself, I think the director, I, I could tell from his first film that he had a very distinctive style. He knew how to do some really cool action scenes, but it didn't really seem like the story was there. And I think having another person write the script for him was definitely 
to his benefit because he's able to take, you know, like like I said, a fairly conventional, fairly uh, even derivative at times film and smartly play it out in a way that, you know, it's very brickly paced, like it, I think 90 minutes exactly. Uh, it doesn't waste a minute. It tells you all the information you need while also keeping a lot of things secretive in a way that I appreciate in uh, John Wick as well, where it's like clearly the world this is kind of heightened and over the top, but we only really kind of get little minute details about it. Like the film just trusts the audience to be like, okay, yeah, like things are a little weird here. This world doesn't fully align with ours, but you just kind of have to go with it. And I appreciate the film for doing that. And I think by and large, the action is really solid. I, I don't think it's quite as violent as I anticipated. Like, I guess I was expecting something a lot more gnarly like Hardcore Henry. It does get pretty violent, but um, not as violent as I anticipated. But it is well choreographed. It's definitely well shot and, and filmed. And I definitely think uh, Odenkirk holds his own. It's I never really expected him to have an action vehicle, knowing him primarily from... Mr. Show and then subsequently Breaking Bad and Bear Call Saul. So I definitely think it's a good showcase for his uh, growingly versatile acting talents. And uh, by and large, I had a good time watching this one. Yeah, I, I just really dug this. I thought that as derivative as it is, all of it just felt it felt fresher than it actually is, I guess. And I think that's because they do the John Wick thing, but they just they do some they do little different tweaks with it. It's not as clean. It's not as well choreographed in like a good way. He feels like a more vulnerable action hero kind of guy. And they sort of explain it to you where it's like because he's out of practice and he just, you know, like he's kind of getting back into it. And I think that it is a fascinating thing to sort of in a way like examine why we find the sort of action and violence such a spectacle. A lot of people could probably look at this movie and be like, all right, it's trying to maybe like say that violence is a good thing almost, or like, you know, everybody needs like an outlet. But I, I took it, a, I took it to be a little bit nicer than that, or a little bit more palatable than that, because I, I do think that there is like a central story here of like trying to just be yourself and be true to who you are, but balancing it with like a healthy uh, understanding of your limitations and going too far. And when the story was like in that territory, I thought it was really fun and exciting and definitely satisfying. The, the times in this movie where I thought it was getting a little bit out of my depth personally was when we started getting these villains, the like Russian mafia villains. And I, I don't know, I'm just so sick of it. So say it's like the same thing in every movie. That it's like this vague underworld of like Russian mobsters. And I just think it's kind of lazy. It's like there are other nefarious forces <laughs> that we can put in movies. Sure. Well, I mean, considering that the filmmaker is Russian, I was hoping that the villains would be a little bit more adept for that reason. And I think there right. are I think they are generally like decent villains like I, I think he's a decent threat and he has some like darkly fun moments throughout there's like one scene involving a chair and at the hospital that that took me aback for a little bit that definitely was a bigger one of the bigger laughs i got out of the film um but yeah i mean i think they serve their purpose i guess serviceable would be the word for the villains like i think they're fine for what they are they they get the you know they get the plot moving in a, in a fashion that i think works but by and large, yeah, I do agree. That I guess I was expecting something a little bit more given the filmmaker here and uh, what was going on otherwise. Yeah, the, the villain is played by Alexei Sabryakov, who I think better known overseas. I, I don't think I've, I recognize him from any films myself, but I, I th yeah, serviceable is the right word. I, I just think that they had an opportunity, I think, to do a little bit more. The only other thing that I found a little underwhelming because, okay, Connie Nielsen... I think she's great in this. I think that the relationship between her and our main character, Hutch, I think that is like probably the most important thing about the movie that they had to get right. But there is this other thing with him and his son. And I, I think there, there was something kind of missing there. There were a few times in this movie where I think that they were sort of like leaving things be for like a sequel. Uh, specifically, I don't want to give away like some of the other character reveals, uh, but they involve Hutch's family. And you could definitely tell like those characters are going to be maybe better explained if there's like a second film or something. But I don't know. I, I just felt like they're they were sort of holding back a little bit in terms of the relationship between this guy and his family. 
but particularly his son, because there's clearly some sort of tension there. There's clearly some sort of like, he looks down on his dad and you're just kind of like, oh man, if you only knew, right? Uh, so I don't know. I don't know if it's a missed opportunity or if it's something that they're just sort of like, just wait, just wait. Well, next film, that'll be a whole thing maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you that like it is probably setting itself for a sequel maybe to a fault to the point where it feels like this might have been a lesser film by trade. But um, I do agree. I think... What I appreciate about the film is that it knows its limitations to a respect and that it doesn't try to overdo it. It just keeps the plot pretty simple, keeps everything moving in a linear fashion. And I really expect a film that, that can be clean in that regard from a storytelling standpoint. That's not to say that there aren't like holes and different logic gaps, but I generally think the movie knows how to keep this, the script pretty compact. There are a lot of like Chekhov's guns, sometimes literally, uh, throughout the film that I think generally play yeah. out pretty well throughout the film, which is definitely something I appreciate in an action film. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if, I guess you don't want to reveal who the dad is, but I thought that character and, and that performance was one of the highlights of the film. Um, the, yeah, that, that was definitely, that, that got some of the biggest laughs out of me and I, I do appreciate, uh, seeing that actor again, it, it's, it's too rare nowadays that we see him. The action in this was definitely, there was a variety of action. They, they find different ways to sort of like, there's one scene that's more of like a brawling scene, right? Where like a fisticuffs, multiple people, but then certain points of this movie, it does get a little bit closer to the highly stylized sort of action that will people will find pretty familiar. It starts to feel at times like a music video, which is pretty fitting considering uh, the director. And I, I kind of go back and forth on it. Like I think it works because by the by the time you're at that point in the movie, this guy has been built up so much that it's just kind of nice to see the movie let loose in the way that he's sort of letting loose. So that all works totally fine. And I I do think the movie does well to not overstay its welcome for sure. And it's just an hour and a half very, very efficient 92 minutes. But there's something about the last set piece. I think it's really fun and exciting, but it gets to be a little bit like Home Alone. And at that point, I was like, is this, I, I don't know, it was losing some of its groundedness. Like it, at for so much of the movie, it had been patient and careful to be like, this is a real, like recognizable world. But then it just kind of throws that all away a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, it's weirdly really reminiscent of the ending for uh, the last Rambo movie, which I wasn't expecting, um, but because they have a kind of a similar third act structure there. But I do agree with you in that. Like, what surprised me about the film was that I think I was actually a little bit more endeared with the first half than the second. Not to say the second half is bad. I think it delivers on the promise, like you said. Like it keeps the action pretty consistent. Bob Odenkirk is good for uh, balancing the comedy as well as the action in the film. But there's something about how the first act is like really concise and it's very meticulously laid out and it builds up the suspense in a way that doesn't drag the film or the pacing but it conveys like you say that kind of like uh mundaneness of his life and just like how things are coming very repetitious and i i really appreciate that early first half especially like the first like 15 or 20 minutes or so when it builds up the stake and the tension even though it does kind of play into like that kind of suburban dad fantasy kind of thing where like you know, something could happen any night. So that, obviously, stuff happens in, in real life and stuff like that, but it kind of feels like where the movie kind of plays into like a certain type of fantasy that I find maybe a little bit worrying if you're trying to look into certain messaging here. But um, by and large, I, I do think this works pretty well. And like you said, it definitely left me excited for a sequel, which I'm, I'm assuming is the intent here, even though, I mean, I don't know how many John Wicks we're going to get. I just hope they all team up at one point, like Avengers style, and just like take down like John McClane or something. I don't know who we already who would have the expendables, man. Well, why not bring them into it? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, yeah, like I, I guess you're right that you could theoretically see nobody and John Wick sort of existing in the same continuity. Well, yeah, because right? um, they, they were talking at one point about doing something similar with like atomic blonde and Charlie yeah. Theron's character in that. So I don't think it's out of it the question. Fits. Yeah. It fits because they, they do sort of tease something like that a couple of times. There's a character played by Riza, we don't give away, that clearly has some sort of like larger background in this. And there's like a character called the Barber, you know, played by Colin Salmon, who you 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 do get like that sort of feel of like if John Wick is more about like the criminal underworld and it's like expansiveness, this movie is more about like government contractors and their whole secret cabal and all of that 
Pretty so, much, yeah, yeah. Pretty similar, I guess, in that respect. I, w- I would say first half of this is like for was for me like basically an A minus. Second half was like a low B. So I'm gonna even it out here and just say that um, I'm a B plus on nobody. I think it's an easy recommend. I think most people are gonna dig it quite a lot. And yeah, even even if you check out a little bit, maybe zone out. I I don't know if I had seen this in a theater with a bunch of people, I think I would have just had it would have probably made my whole week. So I, I hope people check this out because I think it's definitely a good watch. Yeah, I mean, I would say it's somewhere between like a solid matinee kind of film and like a better than average Redbox type movie. It's like somewhere in between there quality wise. Um, I do think, you know, especially not really knowing what to expect, but knowing that Bob Odenkirk could pull something off like this. I, I do think he really does carry this film pretty well. He has like an odd sort of charisma, an everyday kind of charisma that I, I find really appealing. And that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy uh, Better Call Saul, among other things, with him. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's like a low B for the reasons we suggested. I think there's obviously things we can kind of criticize or different threads we can pull. But I think what works here really stands out. And I think it knows, like I said, its limitations and how to make a pretty concise and consistently entertaining film. And by and large, I, I think it succeeds in what it sets out to do. So I had a good time with this one. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's more I, there's more nitpicks, more negative things I could say, but I just had such a good time with it that I don't I don't want to be negative and I I yeah, I, I want to revisit it. I I don't want, I just don't really care that that it's a it's a little bit rough around a few edges, but yeah, it doesn't really to me matter in the grand scheme of how well this movie works otherwise. So, that is nobody. It is in theaters right now. You can actually check it out in drive-in theaters as well if you want to be a little bit safer and it is being released by universal yeah i was gonna say that's how i saw it i meant to mention that earlier as i saw it the drive-in so yeah and it's making money yeah it's made uh, 11 million dollars worldwide so far which yeah for a non-ip movie (laughs) you know still for that's not available as widely available and for like the theater environment still being a little shaky that's pretty good yeah movies are back man how about (laughs) that yeah Let's talk about another film here, and we're, we're going to talk about something that's, uh, speaking of things that are back, Jackass is back, Bad Grandpa, all these movies where you get pranked. That's right, we're talking about Bad Trip, which is now on Netflix. This is a hidden camera pranks comedy film. Is, is there a word that really sums that up? I feel like I'm trying to like add a bunch yeah. of words together to sum it up. I think hidden prank comedy is generally how they're described nowadays. I think that's the general description yeah. for it. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the director of this. This is directed by Kitao Sakurai, who I'm, I just am not aware of who this person is. Well, he, yeah, he's the director for the Eric Andre show. One of the directors for the Eric Andre show. Ah, okay. I've never seen the Eric Andre show, so that, that makes sense. Okay. I feel like I've offended you. You seem really upset that I've never seen the Eric Andre. No, I'm not upset. I was waiting for you to describe uh, whatever you were talking about. (laughs) There was just like a little bit of a pregnant pause where you were like, I thought you were maybe collecting yourself. No, no, no. (laughs) Um, No, I mean, that that, that would explain a lot, though, because I do reference Eric Andre show bits and things here and there. I guess it's kind of similar to you with like Avatar, where I'm just kind of like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, I I, I get the idea of it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I, I really do love the Eric Andre show. I think it's one of the funniest shows on TV, but uh, I'll get into that more when I talk about the film itself. All right. Well, this is actually on Netflix right now. It was going to uh, receive a theatrical release from Orion Pictures. It was going to premiere at South by Southwest last year, but it was postponed because of the pandemic. And then they accidentally released it on Prime Video uh, last year. And then it got pirated a bunch. So this this thing's been in the works. People have been, you know, people have already seen this. Uh, a lot of people have already seen this accidentally. But eventually Netflix got a hold of this, and that's where you can see it now. It stars Eric Andre, Lil Rel Howery, Tiffany Haddish, and a whole lot of unsuspecting people who were not expecting to be in a movie. Well, what is this? What is this about? Yeah. So. The general plot of the film, it, it kind of borrows quite liberally from um, the Dumb and Dumber plot, which is basically like we have these two lifelong friends who uh, are trying to figure out where they want to go in life. They haven't really uh, done a whole lot since high school, and they're just kind of waiting for that one moment in their lives where they really kind of define their paths. And that starts to happen, I guess, incidentally, when Eric Andre reunites 
with a long lost crush that he had in high school. And when he finds out that she is in New York with her gallery, he convinces his friend, played by Lil Ray Howery, to uh, basically go with him on a uh, four day road trip to meet her, where he can, where Eric Andre's character can finally profess his love to this woman. But during the trip, they decide to take Lil Ray Howery's sister's car because she is in prison and they imagine that they can just kind of take it and bring it back without her suspecting. But little do they know that she has escaped prison. And when she finds out that the car is missing, she goes on a hunt for them to get it back. And basically, the plot of the film is a very loose way to connect these various pranks and these different hidden uh, shenanigans, I guess, to you know, basically just tie everything together, which I do appreciate the film is very thin in its plotting in that like it doesn't try to establish too many stakes or too many heavy plot beats. It's just about getting the jokes across. But at the same time, I do kind of wish that the plot was a little bit more in depth than it really is. Yeah, I guess I fall more on the side of like, okay, it's not Borat's subsequent movie film where all of this is sort of gelling into something a bit more Yeah bold or ambitious mm-hmm. right it, it's kind of yeah it's kind of doing something that we've seen so many times before and i think though the reason this works for me a bit and actually makes me really curious to watch more eric andre's stuff uh is because i just genuinely think this is hilarious like just pure comedy mm-hmm. like it, it's simple no well not no nonsense simple oh, all nonsense. nonsense comedy uh, all nonsense, <laughs> all nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but in a good way. I just this made me smile. This made me laugh. This made me yeah. happy. And you know, I I thought, is this what it would be like to go on a road trip with Will Ashton? Probably. Uh, maybe not. But I do agree that um, I think one of the things I love so much about Eric Andre's show is that it basically you know he allows himself a platform to really go as nuts as possible. Like he really lets all of his ambitions go away. He plays this character who is intentionally trying to be like the worst talk show host imaginable. So every single moment of that show is just defined by lunacy and pretty much trying to subvert all of your expectations or any expectations that you would have at any given moment. And I think part of the thing that the movie is able to do is honor that and that like the movie is constantly about trying to be a one up the ante throughout and just doing as many absurd things as possible. But I do think having a plot, even especially a fairly conventional one like this does kind of hinder it in a way because it can't fully have that lunacy of the show because it's constantly has to like stop and start basically. Like we have to watch the characters in the car, get to this place and then we can do our another prank and then we got to get to them in the car again or at a hotel or something. And then we can have another prank. And I think that stop and start function of the film does kind of prevent it from being like a fully consistently funny film but at the same time i think enough of the bits are so inspired and pretty well woven in terms of like integrating actual real life people with the actors that i'm willing to forgive a lot of those faults honestly i think the stop and start thing worked great for me because i thought it was nice that this movie had breathers and that it, it knew when to just sort of pause and let things sort of sit. It's something that I wish more of these kinds of movies actually had. The only thing about this movie that really I, I couldn't quite connect with, I didn't find as funny, was a lot of the Tiffany Haddish stuff in this. It's not that she's not, not being funny. Like there were parts that like clearly like she's going full on. I don't know. Just, I thought the bits weren't as fun. I don't know. Like they just didn't give her the best material by far. So there were times where I was like, well, why? Why even do this? Like, I don't know. I, I just felt like they, they either needed to put more effort into her side of the story, make it come alive more, or just sort of like cut some of that stuff out, maybe. Um, I didn't mind her stuff so much. I thought she did a pretty good job. My only real complaint acting wise is that I think Lou Ray Howery does a decent job with the character, but I feel like there's not a whole lot to his character. Like he is like the definition I of a straight. couldn't disagree more. You know, because I feel like he's the definition ever said on this show. Oh, man, because I feel like he's like the definition of like the straight man that like he really kind of doesn't fully. It's not defined like why he goes along with Eric Andre's character's bits. Like he just kind of like goes along. He's a pushover. In a way that, sure. But that's I feel like that's kind of I mean, that's kind of like safe, though. I feel like from a character standpoint, it just it just feels like like the character work there could have been a lot more well defined comparatively. I thought it was well. I, I, it made perfect sense to me. I thought it served everything pretty well. I liked their dynamic. Like, I think the, the definitely the most negative thing you can say is that it's not original. Uh, you know, it's not. It's kind of like you're saying. It's like it's the de facto straight man thing. 
But for this kind of movie, it totally works because the creativity is all focused on the bits. And because the bits are so good, I per, just personally, I don't really care that he's kind of a familiar character in that regard. And I thought he was full of a lot of surprises, actually. I, and I know there, there, was a, there were a bunch of moments in this where I was like, I, I feel like he's definitely the heart of the movie. And that it comes down to the relationship between these two friends for me. And that's why I think it ultimately works. I think for me, it's just that because Eric Andre is actually playing a fairly kind of down to earth guy comparatively. I mean, by most people's standards, he's not down to earth, but for an Eric Andre character, he's pretty normal. And I feel like if if he was like a way wackier character and Lori Howard playing the straight man, that would make sense. But I feel like they're not their energies aren't that far off throughout the film that I feel like there need to be a little bit more of a differentiation between the characters to really pull off that dynamic. I don't even understand what I'm hearing right now. Sure. Maybe it's because you've watched the Eric Andre show and you've seen him be even zanier, but I thought he was so zany. Well, yeah. Well, okay. So you're talking about Eric Andre. Yeah. Eric Andre yeah, compared. Yeah. No, he's definitely way playing it down compared to the Eric Andre show. But I mean, yeah, compared to like a normal person, I would guess he would, he would be way wackier and zanier. I'd agree. <laughs> That's my interpretation, because in this, I just think that he, he does absurd things constantly. So, yeah, I didn't pick up on that myself. But I, I don't know. I just this brought me joy. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that I, I, I chuckle just at the thought of people like scrolling Netflix and, you know, with their parents and being like, oh, what's this? Eric Andre, Lil Bell Howery. Mom, Dad, come here. Let's watch this new Netflix movie together. I'm, you know, so excited to share this family movie with you two and then just sitting through what happens. And then I, I want to say things that happen in this, but I don't want to give anything away because it's, again, it's like the bits themselves, they, they deserve to be experienced firsthand uh, if you do end up watching the show. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, yeah, I mean, and I'm coming off way more negative than I actually am. I did have a really good time with this. It pretty much was what I anticipate, anticipated it to be. And there are at least... I want to say three or four moments in this film that I think are like some of the funnier movie bits I've seen. One involves a bar. Um, another involves like an impromptu yeah. musical number. Um, yeah. And another involves like a uh, drug sequence in a um, like a grocery store that that's probably that scene's probably the closest to being like Eric Andre show, I'd guess, as, as well as like the gorilla scene probably being like the most like what a prank on Eric Andre show would be. But, um, yeah, I think all, all the bits, like I said before, I'm pretty surprised with how well they're pretty well integrated with, like, the real-life reactions not feeling, like, that much different than, like, what's going on with the energy of the actors. I think that's a credit to their improv styles, that they're able to kind of bounce off the absurdities of what's going on in a way that they can react to people pretty well. And I also appreciate that the movie, it seems like, from what I can tell, especially with, like, the blooper reel at the end, that they, they didn't pick the most outlandish reactions a lot of the time. They picked the people who are actually yeah. kind of, like, you know, trying to understand these people or, like, help them out in some way, which I think is yeah. definitely funnier than if they go, if they went for all people who are just like, whoa, what's happening and stuff, which is, like, you know, it's easy from, like, a comedy standpoint to want to favor that, but I think it was a lot smarter and for the filmmakers to actually favor the people who are actually trying to, like, understand these people or even help them out in some respects, because that, that, that's a lot more interesting, I think, from a uh, comedic standpoint. Yeah, that is that is spot on. Because just watching this, the reactions of people in this movie are what make it even funnier. Just like the way that people just don't know like what to do and how to just process what they're experiencing yeah. is the most human thing about this. Right. And I also really appreciate it because, first of all, it's it's so impressive how they're able to do the hidden camera aspect of it because it looks so good. And like whatever hidden cameras they were using were really great cameras. Like you, you can really get a sense of where everything is. There's a good sense of place. I there were tons of reaction shots they were able to capture. It's really impressive stuff. Yeah, I think that just primarily comes from having done at the time four seasons of the Eric Andre show, which are pretty much filled with like bits like this throughout. So I, I think that's a credit to them. They had like a whole show where they could kind of develop their style and then do a movie. Um, like this, even though it's not technically like the Eric Andre show movie, but you can tell that that experience has, has played out really well for this film. Yeah. One other thing I'd say to you is that this does like some white chicks gags that are pretty, ins <laughs> they're pretty fun. And I, I would also say that it, it's only an hour 20 minutes. I want to say like hour 24. It's so quick. And the musical number you mentioned is very catchy, weirdly. 
Like I, I had it kind of stuck in my head for a little bit. I don't know. I just think this is a sweet, hilarious movie, and I'm so glad I watched it. I, I'm a B. Uh, I'm not too far behind. I mean, even though we were kind of a uh, little critical there, I, I think it's a high B minus. Like I really think the bits that work here are really strong, and I do, I do agree with you that I think it's interwoven in a way that like I don't constantly think about the hidden camera aspects of it. I think they're able to, to put the plot in a pretty good motion without having it be a hindrance. But at the same time, I do think that um, I, I think they could have done a little bit more. Like it just kind of felt like they were playing it safe when it comes to the general storytelling here because they're trying to go as outlandish as they can with the comedy, which I think by and large is a smart move. But at the same time, I do kind of wish that they were a little bit more confident and just kind of going a little bit more berserk with their storytelling and what they're able to do. But maybe they'll do another film in this vein again and, and push themselves a little bit more. I'd certainly like to see it. I mean, I, I would say... Quality wise, it's somewhere like like you said, not quite as good as Borat two, but a little bit better than like Impractical Jokers, a movie. And I think that that's basically what you can expect from this film. You want to know the best thing about this movie? What's that? It has a sixty nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh yeah, which is uh both higher and lower than I would anticipate. If that wow. makes sense. Okay, well that is Bad Trip. It's available on Netflix now. I say watch it for sure. And oh, for sure. I mean, I definitely top, think top it's recommend it. Yeah, no, I I would definitely recommend it, especially as a Netflix watch. Even though I do think this is the type of film that I would like to see in a crowded theater with everyone kind of reacting at the same time. But I think it's also like fairly accessible for a Netflix film. So either way, watching it works. But at the same time, I have to kind of mourn what wasn't with this film. So I prefer watching yeah. this at home with friends, right? Because it's awkward. And so, like, I don't know, watching this with a bunch of people, I feel like I'd go through, like, the happy time murders thing again, but who knows? I guess. I don't know. I just think back to, like, watching, like, Jackass 3 or 3D and, like, how that was, like, a real, like, collective experience. Everyone just kind of reacting to the absurdity of what's going on and stuff like that. I, I think that could have had, they could have had something similar like that with this film and, and we didn't have that theatrical with the experience, but oh well. Let's talk about The Courier. The Courier is a new historical drama directed by Dominic Cook. It stars Benedict Cumberbatch, and it also stars Rachel Brosnahan, Jesse Buckley, Angus Wright. This is a cerebral, low-key kind of espionage Cold War thriller. It has a lot of nods and winks to uh, films of a different era. Uh, one of the films I was thinking about, or recent films I was thinking about watching this movie was definitely Bridge of Spies. And it's so it's its whole deal of like kind of wrestling with the relationship between the uh, America and the UK with Russia, the Soviet Union at the time during the Cold War. This movie takes place in the 1960s during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it centers around a true story of a British businessman who tries to help MI6 get a bunch of intel uh, about the Soviet nuclear program during. The Cold War through a Russian source named Oleg Pinkovsky, who's codenamed Ironbark. And that is why the film was originally called Ironbark. It premiered at Sundance last year to pretty solid reviews. It's coming out now through Lionsgate in the United Kingdom and Roadside Attractions in the US. You can watch it now, and I think uh, it's going to be hitting the UK, uh, I think in may so it's it's not everywhere yet but if you can watch it it is if you can watch it uh right now i think it's just the u.s and maybe a few other territories but okay what do you think of the courier well you saw this uh not as recently as i did right yeah i saw this one a couple weeks ago i actually saw this a little bit before i saw i went to sunday or not sunday it's, um south by southwest so yeah maybe like two weeks ago okay yeah um, so it's been kind of hitting theaters and select and drive-ins and all of that fun stuff. But what, what did you think of the movie? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, by and large, I did. Um, the way I described it to you was that it's kind of like if the informant, the, um, Steven Soderbergh film from a few years ago, if that was told in the style of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, um, that's, I think kind of the tone of it though. I know you were saying that it is also reminiscent of Bridge of Spies, which is a film I guess I just don't have as uh, close to my memory as those other films. So um, I guess make it that what you will. But um, yeah, I mean, I think 
what works really well is that this is the type of film that I think plays to Benedict Cumberbatch's strengths as an actor and that a lot of films lately have been I can see him like kind of trying to push out of his uh, wheelhouse a little bit experiment a little bit more and I think some roles work and some don't but I think this type of role where he's like kind of like you know like a pencil pusher but he's also like you know he he has like a moral conscience like he he knows what's right and what's wrong but he also you know he has his faults and he he can't really do everything right but he is fairly charismatic and he can like win people over at the same time but he is like easily befuddled and kind of like in over his head and I think uh Benedict Cumberbatch is good at playing like dweebs like that as opposed to like something else <laughs> um and I, I I think as a starring vehicle for him it works pretty well I I do I think what holds me back from being an outright good film is that the last, I want to say like 25 minutes, become a different type of film. And it's not to say that that story isn't worth telling. I think, you know, because it is part of the story, I understand why they felt so much time to devote it. But it feels like Tom Hooper took over for that segment and it becomes like this kind of weird like Oscar bait type film. And not it doesn't become bad, but it just becomes a lesser film than I think it was during the more stylistic kind of style bits where it's like kind of darkly comedic it had kind of like a like wry tone and i think that was a little bit more appealing and fun than what we got at the end but um i'm not quite sure where you land on the film i'm curious yeah you know i i, I have a hard time saying anything too extreme about this movie i, I think that it, it it's there's nothing about it that i think is bad necessarily but i don't think there's anything about it that is all that great either it's kind of pretty middling in every possible way. My biggest issue with it is that it's just kind of stiff. A lot of the movie has just a very low, low energy to it. A British film. And there's just a lot of scenes that I, I just couldn't, I don't know, yeah. there, there wasn't a lot of verve. There wasn't a lot of just yeah. the, the tension. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling that all the time, I guess, even though I was supposed to be. I was supposed to be so hooked and so nervous about what's going to happen with these characters that just didn't really happen here, even though I, I cared about the characters for sure. I care a lot about uh, the main two guys in this, uh, played by Benedict Cumberbatch and um, uh, I forget, uh, Angus Wright, where I just think that like or not Angus Wright, excuse me. Um, uh, Marab, N I, I can never pronounce his last name, but Nid Ninzi, Ninzi, I apologize. Um, he, he's great. He's in uh, nowhere in Africa, but, uh, watching them on screen together is I think the best thing about this movie, like their friendship that kind of grows in this and just like the sort of hard boiled nature of their, their back and forth. Uh, there's a scene in here with like that, calls on black swan that i think is really effective and they're they're the movie right but then there's just other times where they try to bring in other characters who just aren't as interesting i think rachel brosnahan i i like rachel brosnahan a lot I, as an actress i think she's really talented in this movie i think she is just not very good and I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion, but I just did not see how her character brought anything authentic to this. I, I just felt like she was like this American character inserted into a movie that is otherwise British. And I just thought it was unnecessary. Like, you, I don't know, there's this whole thing between, cause she's a CIA officer. There's this whole thing where she is like kind of the like heart of a dynamic with a, an MI6 agent and, I just felt like it was a, an unnecessary addition to the movie or one that just didn't ring as true. Maybe they, there was a way they could have done it better. And then there's Jesse Buckley. I love Jesse Buckley. You know this, Will. Jesse Buckley is one of my favorite actors working right now. And I, I just, I hate the character. I hate the way this character is written. The performance is spot on, but just what happens with her character and the decisions and things she says and what they put this character through, I just did not respond well to it. Uh, so th those are all my big negative things for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate that she kind of gets to play a certain stock type of character that, that really doesn't play to her strengths. We just saw her recently and like, I'm thinking of ending things along with many other things where it's clear that she is such a, you know, dy dynamic and strong actress and to have her play, you know, like a character that feels like something reminiscent of like the nineties at this point is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of insulting for someone who is clearly a lot more talented than the role that she was given here. But at the same time, I, I think I am, I guess, a little bit more favorable to this film just because I do like this just a fairly stylish uh, no-nonsense sort of uh, 
uh, button down spy thriller. Like, it, you know, it, it knows what it's going for. It's definitely like a film that's made for adults and it makes no pretensions about it. But at the same time, like I said, I feel like if it weren't for those last few minutes, I think it could have been a lot stronger, a lot more stylistically distinct. And I just feel like those last few minutes just feel like uh, a lesser film, like another filmmaker kind of took over and did something that wasn't quite as interesting as what came before. Now, obviously, I think there's good, in, like, there's a good film to mine from that, that story and like what happens from that point. But I just don't think it really gels well with what was happening before there. And it just doesn't, it makes the film kind of uneven, unfortunately, in a way that I wasn't anticipating from the onset. And uh, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think by and large, quality wise, it's closer to the middle. But I had a good enough time or appreciate enough of this that I would give it a kind and, uh, you know, ad- admirable kind of B minus. We're actually we're not far off. I'm a B minus as well. I just haven't I, I think that I was maybe like overdoing my negative here. But I, I do want to say Cumberbatch, he's the reason to see this. He just he does bring like a humanity and a sincerity to the performance. And I was invested in him. And even though I was frustrated by other things in this movie, by no means does it fail to sort of do what it's trying to do, which is, I think, a difficult thing. It's difficult to make the Cold War interesting. There's no exciting set pieces. There's no like gunfights or anything like that. They have to make conversations and shady rooms interesting. And they do it. They do pull off some of that. They pull off like how intimidating the KGB is, the surveillance state. They they manage to make all of that stuff loom over these characters just not in a way that i thought was tense enough for me to be uh fully into a film that otherwise would be a prestige drama that we would be we would be talking about for oscars i think that it just sort of misses the mark on that so but still a b minus i mean it is very competent and well made and yeah definitely nothing to sniff at yeah i mean it, it reminds me of the type of films i would like to watch at like the more ritzy theater on like a saturday afternoon for a matinee like like a 2 30 right. show or something like that back in theater times where like you know y- you'll probably be in there with like maybe like four grandmas and you know like their respective partners and literally just... me and like yeah like 20 like people in there above the age of 60 right and you know everyone you know kind of keeps themselves like you can kind of hear ruffling from like a like a uh, cough drop or something halfway through the film but everyone's kind of quiet just keeping to themselves and the movie's over and you're just like yeah it was pretty good i like that benedict cumberbatch and you know every, Will, and you just yeah how what? offensive is that offensive well, that was very offensive to me why is that not how grandma charades talks oh was that was that grandma charades i don't know was it i thought that was just a grandma like a like old uh, lady i liked the oh grandma I charades my... what are you doing here i just watched this new movie called the courier i haven't seen you in a while good. Yeah, we actually haven't had we haven't had a talk in a while. You usually talk to my friend, Mr. Millennial, but this is just me, Will. Oh, I can't stand <laughs> that, Mr. Millennial. He oh, always drops me off at the movie theater without money for concessions. Oh, geez, that's that's very inconsiderate. I'm gonna give the courier a C minus. Oh wow, that's pretty pretty strongly negative. I didn't anticipate liberal that. propaganda. Oh wow, okay, so you got a bias against this film. Well. I do. It says that the Cuban Missile Crisis was solved by MI6. Hmm. But that's not the case at all. It was America, baby. All right. Do you have some time? We can talk about this a little bit more if you want to share your thoughts. No, I have to get going to Gold's Gym to get my vaccine shot. Oh, that's good. Wow, that was weird. Who was it? Where'd you go, John? Um, I don't know. This like lady barged in and told me I had to wait outside. So (laughs) okay. Well, I'm glad you got out. That just happened. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, um, I, I caught up with a good friend of mine, uh, Grandma Charade, so it was nice to catch her again. I didn't oh. expect to see her again. That's pretty fun. Um, yeah. But I've, can we talk about the courier? I, I know this, this is what we're supposed oh, to yeah, do. Oh, yeah, right yeah. Yeah, you have some more to say about that? Um, not not too much. I just think it's a historical drama. It, it does its job and does it fine. And yeah, if I, I would see this kind of in a similar circumstance, like in the, you know, in a matinee showing, I'd walk out of it, probably forget most of the movie in a while. And then someone will, someone's going to bring this movie up in a couple of years and be like, well, yeah, remember Cumberbatch and The Courier? And I'm going to be like, no. And then they're going to be like, no, you saw that movie, John. You talked about it. And yeah, that's, yeah. It, it, play, it'll go about Play the way. tape. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That that sounds about right. So a double B minus from the boys. 
and yeah, uh, B for British. Yeah, B minus mm-hmm. for British minus. Yeah, and uh, uh, Grandma Shree, it's out. You weren't around. She gave it a C minus, so she was a little bit more negative than us. Wow. Why? Uh, it's That's a whole thing. Weird. You can you can listen back to the tape. Okay. It's a whole thing. I never listen to Cinemaholics, okay, but you enough. should if you want to hear more of our show, and you want to keep the show going. One other thing you can do is leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. It's so easy. There's one rating on there that says that we we continuous that they're continuously impressed. Have you ever seen that review, Will? What's that? There's a review on Apple Podcasts that says they're continuously impressed. With what? I don't know. With us. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, yeah. how about that? And I wonder, you know, if you feel that way, not you, Will, but the listeners, if you feel okay. that way and you're like, well, I don't want Cinema Honks to go away, then one thing, you, one easy, simple, kind thing you can do is give us a star rating on Apple Podcasts. Say something about us, as long as it's honest. Don't say something nice if you don't mean it. Um, also, don't say anything negative because we don't have the the mental health to really deal with that right now. So, yeah, that's it. Well, you got anything going on this week you want to share with the listeners before we peace out here? Um, well, sometime this week, I have a new episode of my other podcast, Any Ogre Toots Ogre, coming out. Uh, it's really fun. I don't want to give away the surprise there, but I think you guys are in for a treat. So if you listen to that podcast, look out for your feeds for that one later this week. I still haven't watched Master of Disguise. True. I'm, I'm nervous about it. Like, what if I like it? I, I think there's a very low risk of that, but, uh, you uh, know, you never know. I don't know, Will. You've you've been wrong before. I've, I've heard sure. you say all kinds of things about movies that... Sure. I don't know. But okay, uh, I got nothing except for, you know, the typical review spiel. Um, you can always follow us on Twitter and... Uh, be sure to stay tuned on cinemaholics.com for all the bonus content you might want. Uh, we have a Falcon and the Winter Soldier recap of the first two episodes from Adonis Gonzalez, who is reviewing that show week to week. And he, he wrote a really good piece about it, Will, about Sam Wilson, the legacy of his character, and like the race race in Captain America, and just all the, the difficult stuff about that sort of subject you can expect. Uh, well, I, I don't expect you to watch Falcon and the Winter Soldier <laughs> at uh, any point. Yeah, I don't know. I mean... You haven't even watched WandaVision. I have not watched WandaVision. It does seem like this show is not attracting as much uh, social media notice on my end as uh, WandaVision or The Mandalorian, which is, I know, not Marvel, but Disney+. Plus. Um, but it seems like you're getting a different tweet, so maybe it is getting more of a response than I'm seeing. It's like a flash in the pan sort of thing. And it's like a bunch of tweets for like two days and then nobody talks about it for like yeah. several days. That's, but I so guess that was kind of like it's one a vision at first. Yeah. It's a Marvel hit. Yeah. It does. Well, I think like WandaVision, I mean, I didn't watch it, but like every day, like I went online and someone was saying something about WandaVision, like Falcon, the Winter Soldier at the big, oh yeah, that's a thing. That's on, that's on Disney plus. There you go. We'll see you all next week. Thanks as always for listening to our show. From the internet, California, I am John Agroni. And from the internet, Pennsylvania, I'm Lashton. See you next time.